Uh, I have no other intimations. Would you please stand to receive the word of God? <laughs> Once again, I would like to welcome the Reverend Gordon Jameson into the pulpit this morning to conduct our service. A place to give praise and thanks to God, a place to hear the word of God and experience the peace of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Let us worship God. We sing together the hymn 367 for the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Thank you.
Let us pray. Faithful God, accept our humble thanks for all your blessings. You have given us fullness of life. You guide and inspire us. You cover us with your grace day after day. You offer us comfort in times of sorrow and a peace that passes all understanding, even in times of trial and uncertainty. Forgive us, Lord, when we take these things for granted. Remind us of the abundance you have poured out on us. Help us listen for your voice leading us, prompting us to answer your call, encouraging us to give back, to respond in generous humility to your grace, goodness, and mercy. Compel us to reflect something of your love for us, as we give to enable your work in our communities, our nation, and our world. Living God, hear these our prayers, which we bring in the name of Jesus, and in his words we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Some things stick in your memory. And I want to mention one of these things that happened to me oh, more than 50 years ago, a long, long time ago. Annette and I were visiting her aunt and Annette's cousin, who was younger than she was, uh, wasn't very well at the time. And we must have taken some fruit with us, because we handed Kenneth a pear. And his mother said, what do you say, Kenneth? And Kenneth said, I don't like pears. What should he have said? Thank you, yes. But he didn't. He just told us he didn't like pears. I mentioned that this morning because the theme going right through our service this morning is about the gifts of God. And the ways in which we say thank you to God for all his gifts. Thank you is a word we say over and over and over again in our worship Sunday by Sunday. So this morning, we are thinking about the gifts of God. And we're thinking about the ways we say thank you for these gifts. Our next hymn reminds us, again, of perhaps one of God's greatest gifts to us, the world around us. We're going to sing 154, All Things Bright and Beautiful.
Good morning. Our first reading is from Psalm 145, verse 10 to 21. All your creatures, Lord, will praise you, and all your people will give you thanks. They will speak of the glory of your royal power and tell of your might, so that everyone will know your mighty deeds and the glorious majesty of your kingdom. Your rule is eternal and you are king forever. The Lord is faithful to his promises and he is merciful in all his acts. He helps those who are in trouble. He lifts those who have fallen. All living things look hopefully to you and you give them food when they need it. You give them enough and satisfy the needs of all. The Lord is righteous in all he does, merciful in all his acts. He is near to those who call to him, who call to him with sincerity. He supplies the needs of those who honour him. He hears their cries and saves them. He protects everyone who loves him, but he will destroy the wicked. I will always praise the Lord, like all his creatures, Praise his holy name forever. Our second reading is from Romans 5, verse 1 to 11. Now that we have been put right with God through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has brought us by faith into this experience of God's grace in which we now live. And so we boast of the hope we have of sharing God's glory. We also boast of our troubles because we know that trouble produces endurance. Endurance brings God's approval and his approval creates hope. This hope does not disappoint us for God has poured out his love into our hearts by means of the Holy Spirit who is God's gift to us. For when we were still helpless, Christ died for the wicked at the time that God chose. It is a difficult thing for someone to die for a righteous person. It may even be that someone might dare to die for a good person. But God has shown us how much he loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. By his sacrificial death, we are now put right with God. How much more then will we be saved by him from God's anger? We were God's enemies, but he made us his friends through the death of his son. Now that we are God's friends, how much more will we be saved by Christ's life? But that is not all. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. Can we continue our service by singing CH3, number 415, The Great Love of God is Revealed in the Son.
In May of this year, the General Assembly invited Kirk Sessions to hold a National Giving Day on a Sunday of their choice in September or October. Burn South Kirk Session has opted for today, not unrelated to the fact that I, a former head of stewardship for the Church of Scotland, am leading worship today. Somehow when you get involved in finance, you never get away. Many years ago, I attended an evening service in an Aberdeen church. The minister was working his way through the book of Deuteronomy. At the beginning of his sermon, he told us that many ministers would pass over the chapter he had read as they believed it had little to say to people. At the end of the sermon, I thought these ministers were right. The particular chapter in Deuteronomy had little to say that was in any way related to the preaching of the gospel. And there are many chapters in the books of the Bible which are peripheral to the real message. But today's readings here are certainly not in that category. They both take us to the heart of the Bible message. The latter part of Psalm 145 <clears throat> speaks of giving thanks to God in response to His constant goodness to His world and its people. And it contains these marvelous words. The Lord is faithful in all his works and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. In the passage we read from Paul's letter to the Romans, the focus turns to God coming to his world in the person of Jesus and all that this means for us, for our salvation. Again, there are words that take us right to the heart of our faith. God has shown us how much He loves us. It was while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. By His blood, we are now put right with God. We rejoice because of what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ, who has now made us God's friends. Christian giving always begins with God's giving to his world, to his people. And today we are invited to reflect on God's giving God's guidance, God's support, God's love during the time of the COVID pandemic. A couple of years ago, when I was here every Sunday as your locum, one of the congregations said to me that she had never heard the Holy Spirit mentioned in this church as often as I had mentioned it in the previous few weeks. I will never make any apology for that. I don't think we talk about the Holy Spirit often enough. And I believe that the presence and power of the Holy Spirit is the force for good in God's world. Good things happen when people are open to this force for good whether they realize it comes from God or not. During the periods of lockdown and then periods of lesser restrictions, we have shown appreciation for NHS workers in hospitals and in the community, for all those working in the care sector, for the emergency services, 
for lorry drivers ensuring food and fuel supply. For those who had to be working, perhaps in supermarkets, when everybody else was expected to stay at home. And for those advising governments on science and public health, these people were often shadowy figures in the background. But through the last 18 months, we have been able to put faces to names of chief medical officers, directors, national clinical directors, chief nursing officers, and others. And if I've omitted people in other sectors, please forgive me. The past 18 months have been a challenging time for the church. Ministers and office bearers have worked to come to terms with new technology. More use has been made of social media. And Zoom is a medium of which we have now all heard. In these ways, the fellowship of the church continued to some extent, even when we could not use our building. In addition, a great deal of pastoral care was offered through telephone calls, which alleviated much loneliness and isolation. There are many in the life of the church for whose work we should be giving thanks. It has been a difficult time, and it continues to be a difficult time. But there has been so much good for which we should give thanks. And today's National Giving Day is first and foremost an opportunity to give thanks to God for the many ways and through the many people He has kept us going. But our National Giving Day also has a very practical dimension. The church here and everywhere operates with three main worldly resources, people, buildings, and power, and money. Some of the people are employed and have to be paid. Buildings cost money if we are to keep them heated and in good order. Therefore, money is an important resource as far as the church is concerned. Many congregations have come through the last 18 months in a better financial state that might have been envisaged at the outset. And a very big thank you has to be said to all those who have made sure that their offerings were still received by their congregations. Despite the periods of lockdown, some congregational accounts for 2020 actually showed small surpluses. Many others, though, had deficits of various levels. All congregations lost income from fundraising events which couldn't be held and from outside groups who were unable to use their premises. And I've seen national figures which show a considerable drop in total congregational income in 2020. But 2020 was not a normal year for church finance. Yes, congregations tended to have lower total incomes, but they also had lower expenditure as there was little or no activity in church premises. And 2021 is still not a normal year. Expected ministries and mission contributions for this year were reduced 
why the church office is taking money from reserves to lessen the financial burden on congregations. But as congregational activities resume, we are moving back to a time where normal levels of expenditure will also resume. And the National Giving Day is an opportunity for people to make an extra gift of money to their local church. And there is an added incentive to make these extra or special gifts. Most church members know that congregational treasurers send money to the church offices each month. This is to pay the congregation's ministries and mission contributions. In some congregations, there is a degree of resentment about money going to Edinburgh. And you can tell by the way they say Edinburgh. What each congregation is required to pay is calculated on the basis of the congregation's income in the previous three years. And sometimes congregational treasurers and others refer to it as a tax. Extra money raised for normal purposes usually becomes part of the accessible income or subject to this tax. However, Money contributed for the National Giving Day this year will not be included in the accessible income as long as the treasurer includes it as a separate entry, entry in the annual accounts for 2021. These gifts, therefore, are tax-free gifts for congregations, if you want to use that language. Now, all this is a strange topic for a sermon at Sunday worship, but I think it's worth including to help understand what happens to the money that is given. Every penny of National Giving Day gifts will remain with your own congregation for local purposes as the office bearers decide. And I'm sure that if you've not made your gift today, it will still be accepted on one of the remaining Sundays in October. But please remember to mark it National Giving Day so that it doesn't get subsumed in other money. Our giving for the work of the church comes in various forms. We give our money, but we also give our time and our talent. And these gifts are essential in enabling the work of the church. Our gifts are always a response of thanksgiving to God for all that He has given and continues to give us. This is the reason for the two Bible passages chosen for today's worship. Our God is a giving God. Our God is a generous God. When we think of God's gifts, it's often difficult to list them. Here are words written by a soldier in the 19th century. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn to obey. I asked God for help that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked God for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked God for power that I might be given the praise of others. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life 
that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I'd hoped for. Are far beyond anything people of any time or place could expect or could imagine. We can only wonder at the amazing grace of God in Jesus Christ, our Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A hymn that helps us focus on the cross of Christ, the generosity of God's love, and the response that should come from us is 254, when I survey the wondrous cross. Let us pray. Living and loving God, we thank you for your word, spoken to us in the words of Scripture and supremely in the person of Jesus. In your word, you reveal yourself to us. 
And through your word, you teach us your will for our lives. You have taught us that in loving one another, we love you. We give thanks today for all who serve their communities. And at this time, we especially remember all who give their time and skill caring for others those in our health service and our care homes, those who teach in our schools, colleges, and universities, those who drive lorries and work in our supermarkets, those who drive buses and trains, and those who undertake administrative tasks which support the work of others. We pray for those who serve in our governments and parliaments, faced with difficult decisions at the present time, often decisions which are based on personal judgment. We pray for our business leaders and the leaders of trade unions. And we pray for those tasked with communication through the various forms of media. We pray for people in need, those who are ill, those who are disabled, those who mourn the loss of loved ones, those who are unemployed or fear redundancy, those who are hungry or homeless, and all those who are in any way vulnerable. And we bring our own personal prayers for those we know to be in a special need at this time. Hear these our prayers, in Jesus' name, amen. There is probably one hymn more than any other which assures us of the comfort and the peace and the strength of God. And that is the 23rd Psalm, hymn 387, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want.
needs to love and serve the Lord. The God of grace and truth, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is with you now and always. Thank mm -hmm. you. 